today bismillah alhamdulillah salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah allahumma allimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima 'allamtana amin is bab nawaqid al wudu the chapter which pertains to the things which break the wudu so nawaqid is the plural of naqid things which are taken apart naqd means to take something apart right so this is the things which break the wudu also known as mufsidat al wudu the things which spoil the wudu and you're going to find some things that the author will talk about. Number one, they're a bit hard to comprehend because we maybe not find them in our society. And number two, it's as though uh, some of the things are sinful situations. So like Shaykh Bajabir, Hafidahullah, he said that these things are studied for the sake of training the mind in fiqh. It doesn't mean that it's allowed in any way, shape or form, these impermissible acts. Okay, All these things which are hardly found. It's in order to train the to train the mind. طيب. So the author, rahimahullah taala, he said, "Auluhu yankudu ma kharja min sabil," that that which comes out from the private parts, the sabil, the private parts, then it breaks the wudu. What do you think he's referring to here? That which comes out from the private parts breaks the wudu. A bit louder, please. Good, so you're not differentiating between that which is impure or pure, right? Because the urine is uh, najis, but the uh, semen, the money is tahir. So there's no differentiation, huh? That's correct. So anything which comes out from the private part, whether it's pure or impure, or whether it's ghayru mu'atad. Ghayru mu'atad is something like which you do not expect to come out from the private part. Like a stone, for example. If somebody releases a stone, uh, then even this uh, breaks the wudu. One of the uh, proofs is the hadith in Ahmad and Tirmidhi, the hadith we took before of Safwan ibn Asal, radiyallahu anhu, where he said, Kana an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Prophet used to command us if we were traveling not to take off our socks from uh, these things, but rather we should wipe on them, except for the janaba. If we're in a state of janaba, we have to remove the socks. But then he mentioned if you are defecating or urinating or you fall asleep, these things, these things break the wudu, okay? Then you can wipe on the sock. But the dalil, the istidlal, the point of evidence from the hadith is showing us that what, the things which come out of the private parts which he mentioned, which is ghaid, defecation and urinating, this breaks the wudu. So things which come out of the private parts obviously break the wudu, whether tahir or not. The author, he says, وَخَارِجٌ مِنْ بَقِيَّةِ الْبَدَنِ إِنْ كَانَ بَوْلًا And also, لا سمح الله, if something comes out from other parts of the body of urine or defecation how can this be maybe somebody has an operation and you know in the operation he has a cut and a bag is attached to him so his urine tract is not working in the normal way so the urine will come out into the bag la samahallah so in this situation the person's uh, wudu is also considered to be broken why because um, whether it's defecation or urine coming out from a different part of the body, small amount or large amount, it breaks the wudu. And then he says, Or a lot of impurity other than those two, other than ghaid wal bawl, other than defecation or urine, right? Uh, in Abi Dawood, in Tirmidhi and others, it's narrated, Nabi The Prophet vomited, okay? And then he made wudu from that. Okay, so this is one of the evidences. So one of the conditions that Imam author, he mentioned, was that it has to be a lot of impurity. How do we define, how do we determine what is a lot? Ahsant. I think you're saying if it shocks you, right? Now, nafs. If the thing shocks you, when you look at it, and it's a large amount, and it shocks you, right? This is one of the opinions in the madhab. Another opinion, because they say that this one is a bit, it's a bit hard to quantify. Your uh, reaction will be different to my reaction. This brother here may be a butcher. All day long he sees blood, it doesn't affect him, right? So he sees a pool of blood, no problem. In me, I see a tiny bit of blood, I'm gonna faint. 
So it depends on the person to person. So another opinion that you say that it returns to the urf, it returns to the customary norms of the people. That which is known amongst the people to be a lot, that is considered a lot. Which, what is con considered to be a little, that is considered a little. But like the brother correctly said, Jazallah khair, is that uh, that which is shocking to the self. When he sees this amount of pure impurity, then he considers this to be a lot. Tayyib? The author, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says, was aqal. And that your faculties, okay, are taken away from you. What does this mean? Your faculty is taken away from you. You become unconscious. For whatever reason, you sleep or you're sick or you're having an operation. Any of these uh, reasons that take away your uh, faculty, your mental uh, capabilities, then your wudu is broken. And now he gives an exception. He says, Illa yasid al min qa'idin wa qa'imin. Except for a little bit of sleep from the one who is standing or sitting, from the one who is sitting or standing. Why did he give this exception for the one who is sitting or standing? So first he laid down the rule. He said, if, you, if your mind is not with you, whether it be due to sleep or sickness or whatever, right? You lose your consciousness. This breaks the wudu, right? But then he says, except for the one who is standing or sitting whilst sleeping. Because standing and sitting, you cannot sleep for a long time. Just a second. Very good. That's it. So standing or sitting, your sleep will not be deep, which means if your sleep is not deep, you can tell whether something has come out of you. You can tell whether you have broken your wudu, right? So as long as you are able to hear what is going on around you, you are able to tell uh, whether something has come on out or not. Imam Abu Dawood and Bayhaqi rahimullah ta'ala, they have the hadith of Anas radiallahu anhu, where he said, Kana ashabu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al isha al akhira hatta takhfiqa ra'usahum, thumma yusallun wa la yatawadda'un. That the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as narrated by Anas, he said they used to wait for the isha, the second isha he means, because the first Isha is called Maghrib. The second Isha is, uh, the last Isha is known as, is the Isha that we know. He said they used to wait for this and they would be sitting to the extent that their heads would be going back and forward from sleep. Like they would fall into sleep, then they would wake up, right? So this is light sleep. And he said, then they would get up and pray without making wudu. So this is a clear proof that the companions held this opinion that if it's light sleep, it doesn't break your wudu, right? But if you're not standing, or you're not sitting, then the least amount of sleep breaks your wudu. So the condition is that you have to be standing or sitting. What about like this? I'm sitting. Does this apply? I'm leaning against something, right? So it, it has to be sitting or standing without leaning against something. Because even though I'm sitting now, I can have a deep sleep. Whereas if I'm not sitting, then if I fall into deep sleep, I'll bang my head on the floor, probably, right? With a standing. Or, or sitting, I'll wake up quickly. طيب ومس ذكر متصل أو قبل بظهر كفه أو أو بطنه أو باطنه. The author he mentions that if the person touches the private part, okay, which is connected, and the reason he mentions that it's connected is to take out the situation, which is not often possible. But it could be that somebody had an, an operation and the private part was removed and then that had to be carried to a place or buried or something of that state. So if that was the state, the touching was that the private part is not connected to the person, then this doesn't break the wudu, right? But if it's connected to the person, <coughs> then um, if it's touched with the hand, whether the inside of the hand or the outside of the hand, then it breaks the wudu. So if you touch your private part with your elbow, your foot or any other body part, it doesn't break the wudu. The condition here is that it has to be with your hand, the zahir uh, or right? The outside of it or the inside of it. Imams Ahmed and Nisa'i, they mentioned the hadith of Busra bin Safwan, radiyallahu anha, where she said that the Prophet sallallahu said, man masa dhakarahu falyatawadda. Whoever touches his private part, then let him make wudu. And this applies to women also. The women, if they touch their private parts, then this will break the wudu because in the hadith of Ahmad and Bayhaqi and Ibn Mulaqin rahimahullah ta'ala said it's sahih, the hadith is authentic. Any woman that touches her private part, then she should make wudu from that, right? 
So we said that the touching is with the hand, not any other body part. And also it's not with a barrier. Like if it's done from the clothing, then this doesn't break your wudu. It means it's done under the clothing without any ha'il, without any barrier, okay? Why? Because in the hadith collected by Ahmed ibn Hibban and Al-Hakim and others, we have the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu who said that the Prophet sallallahu said, Man afda biyadihi ila dhakarihi laysa dunaha ha'il faqad wajaba alayhi wudu. Whoever reaches with his hand, specifically mentioning the hand, laysa dunaha ha'il and there's not a barrier between his hand and the private part, then wudu becomes obligatory upon this person. Okay, so it shows us that if you do, if you touch yourself from with a barrier like clothing, then it doesn't break your wudu. Tayyib. Now the Imam he says, "Walamsuhuma min khunta mushkil." Okay, "Walamsuhuma min khunta mushkil." Just let me return for a second. Oh, yes, خلاص. And now the Imam he's going to talk about the situation where a person has both private parts. Okay, the, uh, a person is found to have the masculine private part as well as the feminine private part. Hermaphrodites, right? These are called, right? And this person, the mushkil here, is not clearly defined in the person which gender this person is, right? One or the other has not clearly been defined. But it's found that the person has two. That's why the author said mushkil, okay? A khuntha mushkil. That the person who has both, but it's not determined as to uh, which gender is clear. So the, what they mean here is that if the private parts of that person are both touched, both touched, meaning the female and the male private part, then this breaks the wudu. Because for sure, one of them is asli. One of them is the, the correct private part, right? So for sure, then this breaks the wudu of, of the person doing the touching, right? But if the one doing the touching only touched one of them, then the wudu is not broken. Because maybe the private part is not asli but za'id. This is what the ulama they say. Because it's not sure. Is this the actual private part of the person or not? Tayyib. And if a male person touches the male private part of this hermaphrodite of the khuntha, okay? touches the male private part of this uh, khuntha, then if this is with desire, then the wudu is broken. Because if it was an actual male private part, then he touched the male private part with desire and that breaks wudu. If it wasn't the actual male private part, then he ended up touching a female, right? Because it had both parts and that also breaks the wudu. Aw untha qubuluha. Or if the female, a female touches the female part of that person, right? Li shahwatin, due to desire, then that will break the wudu of that female. Okay, a woman touches the hermaphrodite's female private part, right? If it's the original, if it's the correct private part, then that breaks her wudu. If it's not the correct private part, it means she touched a man, and that also breaks her wudu, right? So basically, in any situation, touching the private parts of the hermaphrodite breaks the wudu for, for the woman there. I, I, I don't know the reality of uh, the reality of the situation of the hermaphrodite. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So it's it's not about the hermaphrodite touching themselves. It's about another person touching the hermaphrodite. Yeah. Right. The Imam he mentions the author that if a person touches, if a person touches a woman with uh, desire or he is touched by a woman uh, by desire then this will break the wudu but now this touching is not like the previous touching that we mentioned when a person touches their own private part when the person touches their own private part we said it's only with the hand that breaks the wudu yeah here your wudu is broken if any of your body part touches the private part of the opposite gender with shahwa with desire okay so if it's done with desire then it breaks uh, the wudu because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran when he's talking about the things which require you to make wudu or ghusl awla mastumun nisa in surah al-ma'idah or you touch the women okay or a woman is touched with desire and the, stip the stipulation of the fact that shahwa desire must be there 
for the wudu to be broken is found from the following evidence and others. In Bukhari and Muslim, it's narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha that she said, كنت أنام بين يدي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وكانت رجلي في قبلته that I used to sleep in front of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and my feet would be in the direction of his qibla meaning that he would be making sujood towards my feet فإذا سجد غمزني and then when he would go into sujood the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would poke me poke at my feet okay and then I would move my feet out of his way and when he would stand up again I would again extend my feet so what's the evidence here to show that you have to have desire when touching a female for your wudu to have been broken? What's the wajhul uh, dalala here? Mm. Exactly. Had it been just a mere touch, had it been just touching the, the female gender, breaks your wudu, then the Prophet ﷺ's wudu would have been broken here. But it wasn't broken. So it means that we can understand that the touching has to be with desire, right? And that is the correct opinion. The touching, touching has to be with desire. The author, he says, And also breaks the wudu is if you touch the, um, the, the exit of the anal passage. The exit of the anal passage, right? Not the flesh around that. It's only referring to the exit itself. If that is touched, the male or female anal passage with, with desire or not, or not, then that breaks the wudu. Tayyip? not referring to that which is around it. Also, sorry, going back to the point we mentioned, man masa dhakarahu falyatawadda, whoever touches his private part, then he has to make wudu. We said that this is with the hand and not with the cover, but this doesn't pertain to the groin. If a person touches his groin, then his wudu is not broken. This only pertains to the actual private part itself, okay? The author, he says, wala masu sha'rin wa sinnin wa dhufurin. If you were to touch the hair of a person or the tooth of a person of the opposite gender, okay, or the nails with desire, this doesn't break your wudu. Why, what do you think the ta'leel is here? What is the reasoning for this author's statement? If you were to touch a woman's teeth, her hair, or her nails, then this doesn't break your wudu according to the author and those who agree with him. So, yes. So, we, we can't say that the, there's not parts where desire may be there because somebody may have that type of desire, right? That they like to touch a woman's hair and that gives them desire. But you're, you're close. They say that this is considered munfasl. This is considered separated from the body, right? The hair, the teeth and the, the nails. They are considered separate to the body. Therefore, the... Um, the ruling is not given. Also, the author says, well, wa amrad. If you touch an amrad with desire, then the wudu is not broken, according to the author's opinion. The amrad is a youth who hair has started to grow, but not on the face. It's only the mustache, right? The amrad, like our young brother here, and hair, right? A young youth whose uh, hair on the uh, moustache has started to grow but not on the face. They say that if this person was touched out of desire, I remember we said this is something which is filthy, it's not permissible. The only reason the author mentions it, in case it happened, what would the situation be? What would the ruling be, right? So it's something which is clearly haram. If, it, if this person was touched with desire, then the author is saying that the wudu is not broken. Why? Of the one doing the touching. Why? Because the ayah, which we mentioned before, Awla Mastumun Nisa, spoke about women. And this is not included as being a woman, right? However, there is another opinion from Imam Ahmad that it breaks the wudu. Tayyib. Wala ma'a And the author says, and not broken wudu if this touching is done with a barrier. We, also, we already mentioned this, right? That if somebody touches uh, what's having uh, gloves on or they're touching. Uh, the opposite gender or even themselves whilst clothing is there then this doesn't break the wudu the touching is if it touches the skin and nor is the uh, wudu broken off the person who is being touched right so you're touching somebody the opposite gender with desire your wudu breaks 
But their wudu that author is saying does not break even if that person experiences desire. Tayyib. They say why? They say La yanqud wudu al insan bi fa'li ghayrihi. That the wudu of a person is not broken due to the action of somebody else. It has to be due to the action of themselves. Right? So here you're touching the opposite gender with desire. Your wudu is broken, but not their wudu according to this opinion. And there's another narration from Imam Ahmad that says the opposite. That says that yes, even with desire, uh, then the person's, uh, would, if with desire, then the person's wudu is broken. The one being touched, okay? In the second opinion of Imam Ahmad. The author, he says, وَيَنْقُدُوا غَسُوا مَيِّتِ وَيَنْقُدُوا غَسُوا مَيِّتٍ your wudu is broken if you touch, if you wash the dead, if you're washing the dead believer. What does it mean here? It's not the person who's pouring the water, it's the one who's actually doing the touching, the washing, or the person who is helping to move the dead from side to side. These two that are touching, their wudu is considered as being broken. Why? Because Imam Abdul Razak in his, in his Musannaf, Musannaf meaning the collection of the statements and the actions of the companions radiyallahu anhu He collects that Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu was asked A'ala man ghasala mayyatan ghusl Is there upon the one who washes the dead person ghusl? Meaning the one who washes the dead person does he have to make ghusl? So Ibn Abbas rahimahullah ta'ala radiyallahu anhu he said la Idhan najasu sahibahum He said no if we were to say that there was ghusl by washing the dead person, that would insinuate that the dead person is impure. He's an object of impurity. Walakin wudu. But rather, what you have to do is to make wudu. So this was the understanding of the companions, radiallahu anhum, that if you wash the dead person, you have to make wudu. What is the ta'lil possibly? What is the reasoning here possibly for you having to make wudu? From washing a dead person. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you touch some, touch some impurity, right? Or maybe you even ended up touching the private part. So they say, due to this, to be safe, then you have to make wudu. Another opinion of Imam Ahmad, Ibn Qudama, and the majority, they say no. In this situation, the wudu doesn't have to be made. The next thing which we consider as breaking the wudu, وَأَكْلُ الْلَحْمِ الْخَاصَةً مِنَ الْجَزُورِ That if somebody eats the flesh of a camel, then this breaks the wudu, right? We have in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Jabir ibn Sumrah, where the Prophet ﷺ said, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, atawadda'u min luhum al ghanam. Should I make a wudu, O Prophet of Allah, from eating the, the, the flesh of the lamb? The Prophet ﷺ said, In shit, tawadda. Wa in shit, la tawadda. If you wish, go ahead and make wudu. And if you don't wish, then don't make wudu. So here it's mustahab, right? You don't have to make wudu from eating the meat of the ghanam, of the lamb. Then the same man, he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, atawadda'u min luhum al-ibl. O Prophet of Allah, should I make wudu after having eaten camel flesh? The Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, yes, tawadda min luhum al-ibl. Wash from, make, from eating the flesh of the... Oh, mashallah, tabarakallah, I thought it was a cat. Make uh, wudu from eating the flesh of a camel, right? Make wudu from eating the flesh of a camel. So this pertains only to that which is known as flesh, right? Not the heart and the kidney and things like this, right? Only the actual which is understood to be flesh, right? That's what is considered here as breaking the wudu. Why? Why they say we don't include the other parts of, of, the, of the body from the camel? They say the illa, the reasoning here for this ruling, of eating camel's meat, breaking your wudu, is ta'abudi. Ta'abudi means la yu'qal ma'nahu. You can't understand the reasoning behind this. It's something whereby you just submit to the ruling. You submit to Allah's command. And when you have an illa, a reasoning which is ta'abudi, you cannot make qiyas here. You cannot make analogical deduction or reasoning, right? You cannot make qiyas. So we can't take this ruling and apply it to the rest, the other parts of the camel. It can only be applied to the flesh because that is what was mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The majority of the ulama, they say you have to make wudu from, you don't have to make wudu. The majority of the ulama, they say you don't have to make wudu, right? They have in the hadith of Nisa'i 
collected by Imam Nisa in Abi Dawood, the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah, where he said, كَانَ آخِرُ الْأَمْرَيْنِ مِنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم, تَرْكُ الْوُدُوءُ مِمَّا مَسَتَ النَّارِ that the last of the command, two commands of the Prophet وسلم, was that you leave alone wudu from that which has touched fire. Meaning that which has been cooked by fire, you don't have to make wudu for it. So according to this hadith, it includes all types of meat, right? So now the majority of the saying, based upon this hadith and others, you don't have to make wudu. But the Hanbali scholars, our author and others, they said before, the hadith I quoted of Jabir ibn Subra, that you have to make wudu, right? When the Prophet ﷺ was asked about it. Sheikh Ahmed Khalil, he mentions that when you have situations like this, one of the things to look at is that in Usul al-Fiqh, you have something which is known as khas and am. Khas means specific, am means general. So which one of these two hadith is khas and which one is am? Which one is speaking about something more specific and which one is speaking about something more general? So the second hadith is more general because it covers all types of animal, right? Tarkul wudu mimma masatun nar. Leaving wudu from anything which is cooked by fire, right? This is am, general. The previous hadith of Jabir ibn Sumra is, is uh, khas, is khas, specific for the camel. So the rule is al khas muqaddam al am. That the khas, the specific hadith is given precedence, precedence over the general hadith when there's a clash, right? So the opinion of our author stands, inshallah, in a valid way, as mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Khalil. The Imam, he says, the author, he says, And everything which obligates you to make a ghusl, then obligates you to make wudu. Tayyib, why do you think that is? What is the ta'lil here? Everything that obligates you to make ghusl, obligates you to make wudu, meaning it, you cannot suffice just to make ghusl, according to this opinion. You have to also make wudu. Why? They say the ta'leel is that if that you're in a state of hadith al-akbar, then min bab al-awla, then more so, you're going to be in a state of hadith al-asghar. This is their opinion, right? The majority and Ibn Taymiyyah from the Hanbalis, they say no, a ghusl is only that which suffices, right? The Imam, he says, he moves on and he says, مَنْ تَيَقَّنَ الطَّهَارَةَ وَشَكَّ فِي الْحَدِّثِ Whoever is certain about having purity, but has doubt that he is in a state of hadith, well, how can this be? You're sure that you made wudu, right? But now when you came to the salah, you had a little doubt. Did I pass wind or not? Or did I touch something that broke my wudu or not? What do you do in this situation? Huh? You stay upon the yaqeen, you stay upon that which you are certain. And what you are certain about is that you made wudu just a few moments ago. So you're sure that you are on wudu. What is the proof for that? What is the proof that you should act upon certainty? We took this a few weeks ago in one of the chapters. <laughs> Can't remember? The hadith of Abdullah bin Zayd radiallahu anhu. He said, Ja'a rajul in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shukiya a rajul ila Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anhu yajida shayfi fi salah. Faqal la yansarif hatta yasma'a sawtan. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ or was complained about a situation uh, that a person found some movement in his stomach whilst praying so he was doubtful have I broken wudu or not the Prophet ﷺ told him do not leave your salah until you hear the sound of breaking wudu or you smell the passing of wind okay so remain upon certainty so this hadith is a qaida and we said that there is a rule Al-Yaqeen la yazulu bishak That certainty is not removed due to doubt Okay, so this is what the author is talking about Man tayaqna tahara wa shakka fil hadith Whoever is sure that he had purity But doubts that he broke his purity You remain upon what you were sure upon Or the opposite situation You were sure that you had impurity in a state of hadith But you can't remember did I make wudu or not So you have to go back to the yaqeen You go back to the certainty which was before that you were sure that you were in a state of hadith. So the person acts upon a yaqeen, right? Now here he mentions a third situation where you have to really switch on a little bit. He says, فَإِن تَيَقَّنَهُمَا If he's sure of both of these situations, that he's sure that he is in a, he's sure that he passed a state of tahara, 
he showed that he passed a state of purity. He showed that he made wudu or the like, right? And at the same time, he showed that he broke his wudu. But he's not sure which one was first and which one was second, right? So he's not sure which one was first. Then he has to be on the opposite situation of what he was before this situation. <laughs> Let me explain this again, inshallah, with examples. So to make it simpler, first and foremost, if somebody an hour ago was in wudu, right? So an hour ago, the person was in the in state of wudu. Then he stayed in the masjid for a whole hour, getting the reward from Allah Azawajal for waiting for the next salah. But then after that hour, he's not sure now. Did I break my wudu? Or did I, and did I make my wudu? He knows that both of them have happened, sorry. He knows that for sure he broke his wudu, and he knows for sure he made the wudu. But he's not sure which one took place first. Did he break his wudu, then make wudu? Or did he make wudu, then break his wudu, right? So he's unsure in this situation. So the author is saying, as a rule of thumb, then you have to go back to the opposite situation of what you were in before this situation took place. So we said the person was in wudu, he was in a state of purity because he prayed, and then he sat in the masjid. Then came upon him a situation of two certainties. For sure he made wudu, and for sure he broke wudu, but he's not sure which one of them came first. So you have to go back to what was before, which he was in tahara, and you have to flip it. You have to make it opposite, which is now that he's in hadith. Right? So anytime this situa situation happens, what's the ruling you say to the person? Go back to what you were, were before this situation and be on the opposite of that situation. Right? Now, here's the hard part. What is the ta'leel? What is the reasoning and the understanding for this? How did they come to this? Sheikh, um, Sheikh Hamad al-Hamad, in his explanation, he said, it's like this. He said, the person, let's give an example, Staying with the example, the person is in the situation of Tahara, stayed in the masjid. After an hour or so, he's sure that he broke his wudu and he's sure that he made wudu, but he's not sure which one he did first. So here is Tahara an hour ago, right? He's in a situation of wudu, situation of purity. After an hour, now he's certain that he made wudu and he broke wudu, but not sure which one came first. So what does he have to do? This tahara which was an hour ago, now for sure it's been removed. How do we say that? Because he's sure that there was a hadith, that there was a breaking of wudu. So this tahara, we put an X on it, is gone, right? That original tahara. Now he's in the situation where he has the purity and the hadith. Both of them happened, but he doesn't know which one came first or which one came second. So this, because they're opposing each other, then he also have to remove that. So what situation is he in? Hadith, right? He's in the situation of not having wudu because the first, the first tahara was removed by the hadith which definitely took place. But then the fact that there is a wudu and a hadith but we don't know which one came first, they're opposing each other, we we'll remove that. So he ends up remaining in the situation, he ends up being in the situation opposite to what he was before, in the situation of hadith, right? Let's take the, another example, the opposite scenario. The person is in a state of hadith, he's in a state of impurity, not having wudu, right? Now after an hour, he's sure that he made wudu and he's sure that he had hadith, but he doesn't know which one came first. So this situation of hadith, we know for sure that it was lifted by the wudu which came an hour after, right? So we have to put an X on the hadith. So now we have the purity and we have the hadith. But because they're opposing each other, we put an X on them. So what's left? The opposite of this situation, the hadith. Okay, we know it was lifted, so he has a tahara. Inshallah, a bit confusing, but in any case, the simplest way of remembering it, if the situation ever arises, you go to the opposite of the situation that you were in before the confusion rose. Right? That is what the author is trying to tell us. Inshallah. Tayyib. And don't worry if you're confused, because I even read from some of the ulama which are known to be Allah Mubarak Fihim, famous ulama, they were confused in their explanation. They got it wrong. So some got it right, some got it wrong, right? So it's, it's a confusing situation. May Allah give us tawfiq, inshallah. What do you do in the situation, if a situation arises where you just can't remember? I can't remember my situation before or now. I can't remember what it was an hour ago. I have no idea what it is now. In this situation, what do you do? You have to make wudu, right? Because you have to pray with the certainty of purity. 
So you have to make wudu. And in all the situations that I mentioned before, it's better to make wudu. You don't lose out on anything. You end up praying with yaqeen and you get the extra reward for making the wudu. The Prophet said, that ma yuribak ila ma la yuribak. Leave alone that which gives you doubt to that which doesn't give you doubt. This is always a principle in the religion, especially pertaining to the acts of worship. Leave alone the doubt and act upon certainty if you can. The Imam says, وَيَحْرَمُ عَلَى الْمُحْدَثِي مَسْهُ mushaf." It's impermissible for the person in the state of hadith, whether that is hadith al-akbar or hadith al-asghar, to touch the Qur'an. If you don't have wudu, you can't touch the Qur'an, right? This is the opinion of all of the former dhahib, which means it's the opinion of nearly a thousand or so scholars, right? So it's a well-established, validated opinion uh, understood by hundreds and hundreds of scholars. They took it from the verse in the Qur'an where Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَّرُونَ تَنْزِيلُ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Pertaining to, according to some of the ulama, the lawh al-mahfuz, and others they say it also pertains to the Qur'an, that none touch this except for those who are in, pure, pure of being and pure in state, right? That none touch the Qur'an except for those who are pure. And also we have from Imam Malik who collected, and we have Abdul Razak in his Musannaf, and Ibn, Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, and many other Imams. There's a letter that was written, and it's uh, narrated by Amr ibn Hazm radiyallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu wrote a letter and in it he said لا يمس القرآن إلا طاهر that none should touch the Quran except the one who is pure so many of the imams of hadith and fiqh they said that this is a well documented and understood valid letter so in it the Prophet sallallahu wrote that none should touch the Quran except for the one who is in a state of purity right the imam he says was salah and also you cannot uh, touch the Quran. Sorry. Also, after not being able to touch the Quran, if you have, if you don't have purity, you can also not pray. Obviously, because in Bukhari, the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu said, "La yaqbal Allah salat ahdikum ida ahdatha hatta yatawadha." That the Allah azza wa jal will not accept the prayer of one of you if he breaks his wudu until he again renews his wudu. Okay. So it's a must. And also tawaf, so, so, make a tawaf around the Kaaba, so come belating the Kaaba, right? Imam Tirmidhi and Hakim, they collect the statement of Ibn Abbasin, oh, sorry, narrated by Ibn Abbasin radiyallahu anhu, collected by Tirmidhi and Hakim, rahimahullah ta'ala, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, at-tawafu hawl al-bayt, mithlu salah. That tawaf around the Kaaba is like the salah. Illa anna kumta takallamuna fihi. Except that you are allowed to speak in it. Fa'idha takallama ahdukum, fala yatakallamanna illa bi khayr. So if one of you was to speak while making tawaf, then only speak with that which is good. So the hadith is saying that tawaf is like the salah. Right? So it has to have the same condition, which means that purity has to be there from the one to make the salah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions pertaining to what we took, then feel free. If not, may Allah azza wa jal reward us immensely for this gathering. And uh, do refer to the video in the parts which you found confusing, inshallah. Zakum